they came to Jericho. And as he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling to you. So, throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see you again. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of the Lord. Merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, grant that we may see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly day by day. Amen. Please be seated. Maybe you remember in high school, Cody remembers in high school, or uh, college, when you would get a term paper. And the teacher would say, yeah, you know, you've got to pick a topic, you've got to do some outlining and some research, and it's due in a month and a half or something like that. Well, you feel like you've got forever to do this paper. Maybe you don't even make any of the big decisions uh, about what it's going to be about or how long it's going to be or something like that, because a month or a month and a half from now it might as well be forever in the future. And then, day by day, a little closer, a little closer, and by the end of the time, the night before it's due, you uh, suddenly start feeling the pressure. Um, or a, a happier thought, um, when, my, when uh, Patricia and I were, before we had children and uh, any money or anything like that, we, um, my parents retired to Florida. And so they had a guest room in a house not too far from the ocean. And, uh, they were willing to feed us when we were there, so it was a, it was a good, uh, good place to choose to go on vacation. And so we'd go there for a week, you know, we both had very busy jobs, and I really remember getting there, leaving the cold Boston winter, gritty city winter, and arriving in this wonderful place with warm, moist air and palm trees and green everywhere. And, uh, and just feeling like I had forever. I, you know, I sat down that first day, I didn't have any deadlines, I didn't have anything I had to do, you know. Um, the, uh, I didn't have to get accomplished anything, sit by the beach, sit by the pool, whatever. Um, but then around three days later, you start thinking, uh-oh, this is, this time is winding down. You know, if we're gonna get to our favorite restaurant, we better schedule a time and we can go do it. Um, or the, whatever the tourist trap is that uh, you do every time you go there. And then the last day you're there, it's a little melancholy. You're thinking all the time, oh, I can't believe they're going to make me go home. They're going to make me leave this paradise and go back to the grit. Um, well, I think a little bit of that is going on in this morning's gospel. And uh, even if it's not explicit, if you really think about it, read the last three chapters, um, leading up to this, I think you can feel a little bit of this. The, um, the section of the Gospel begins in the 8th chapter, when Jesus is way up as far north as he goes during his ministry, Caesarea Philippi. And you remember the scene, it's a famous scene. Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they say, John the Baptist or some of the, one of the prophets or something. And then he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Messiah. 
And Jesus then starts talking about going to Jerusalem. He says, I'm, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be um, handed over to the chief priests. I'm going to be put to death and on the third day rise. And that's the first time he said any of that. And then they start marching toward Jerusalem. I mean, I don't, I don't know that he tells them that that's where he's going. If you read the next three chapters with, with a you know, Bible that has a map in the back at your hand, you'll see he's getting closer and closer to Jerusalem the whole time. And several times during this period, he says, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be handed over to the chief priests, I'm going to be put to death, I'm going to rise up. And you can imagine that that first time he said it, way up in Caesarea Philippi, you know, way, open, way more than 100 miles away, by foot, from Jerusalem, it'll take them weeks to get there. Nobody's thinking seriously about this. Maybe they're asking theoretical questions. Well, why would he say that? Or, I don't know, I don't understand this. But nobody's really focused on it. I think. And the way they would be focused on it is they get closer and closer and closer. Each time Jesus says it again, on that long trip to Jerusalem, you can imagine it's a little more real this time. It's, he's going to get to Jerusalem. He's going to be put to death. I mean, are they gonna, is there a posse of chief priests that's going to jump him as soon as we go in through the gates of Jerusalem? We don't know. Now it says they're in Jericho, just a couple of miles from Jerusalem. And not only that, but it says they are leaving Jericho. And so you can imagine the whole crowd is buzzing. What's going to happen? You know, it's an easy afternoon's walk to Jerusalem. It's going to happen. It's going to actually happen. Whatever it is Jesus is planning, it is going to happen, and it's going to happen very soon. You can almost imagine the towers of the temple in front of them as they leave Jericho. And there, great crowds following, noise everywhere. You can imagine it's very, very tense. Um, and Jesus himself is probably pretty tense. Remember how he weeps in the garden the night before he's going to be put to death. I mean, he is nervous about this, you would imagine. There's, there's anxiety, even though he knows he's doing the right thing. And uh, way over here, in the corner of the picture, is one guy, blind beggar, the least important guy in the whole picture. You can, I mean, by any, by any measure, he is someone that you could miss. And Jesus, if it could ever be said that someone has a lot on his plate, Jesus has a lot on his plate. And so all that momentum, all that narrative momentum, everything pushing them, pushing them to get to Jerusalem and see what's going to happen. And this one guy over here cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And his, Jesus' disciples tell him to shut up. Come on, this, is, this guy's got a lot on his plate. He doesn't need to hear from you. But all the more, Bartimaeus cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus <clears throat> not only hears him, but he stops the whole parade. He doesn't just, you know, Jesus could do this. He could wave a miracle in his direction, okay, receive your sight, he could then go on. But he doesn't. He stops the whole thing. He brings the guy out through the road and looks him in the face and says, what do you want me to do? And Bartimaeus says that I might see again, and, and Jesus gives him his sight. It is an amazing moment when Jesus puts what Christians believe is the most important event in the history of the world, the, you know, the, the death and resurrection of Jesus, when he puts that on hold for a moment to bring out this man who is spends all of his time um, helpless. He's sitting there by the side of the road, he can't see. He is completely dependent on other people for his, for his sustenance. You know, will I have enough food to eat today, or will I not? It, it's all a matter of just him calling out from time to time and hoping that people will drop some coins on his cloak. And Jesus takes him seriously and brings him out and Yes. You know, as we have gone through this period from the first time Jesus talks about what's going to happen, and now Jesus has been teaching about how 
his disciples should live together and what it means to be a community and, and to, to um, really focus on their life together. And um, one of the things that has happened, it just happened immediately before this story, as a matter of fact, is that Jesus talked about what's going to happen in Jerusalem. And then, as happens often in the, God, in the Gospels, um, his disciples start talking about who's going to be the most important in the kingdom of heaven. You know, they're competing with each other for, for, for the best top of the, top of the heap. And, uh, and Jesus hears about it and he says, I'm paraphrasing here, but he says, you sound like a bunch of Gentiles. He says, the Gentiles uh, live this way. They, um, they try to get a little advantage over each other, and, and when some gets a little more advantage, they, they, get, they, they call him Lord, and, and ultimately, one of them gets the most power, and, and they call him the, <clears throat> the, the benefactor. And what he's saying is, the world will tell you that it has the power to, 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 to give labels to people, and your job in life, as all of us, are trained to think at some level, your job in life is to get to the top of the heap, to make sure that you get yours, to make sure that you get the honor due you, to make sure that you get the, the, the respect and, and the stuff due you. And Jesus says, it's not the way it's going to be with you. With you is going to be the, the, the one who serves is going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus, as he goes to Jerusalem, as he prepares to give himself as a sacrifice for them, um, you know, this is my body given for you, this is my blood shed for you, as he prepares to, to show them by this example what his priorities are, he is telling them that they have to, they can't look at the world on the world's own level, they can't take the world's word for things. They can't look at the world through the labels that the world puts on things. They have to see in this new way. They have to be open to the power of God, the face of Jesus in the eye and the face of the stranger. They need to be able to see past the surface and past the labels to see deeper and to really appreciate the, the presence of God all around you in the world. As we turn the corner right now into, um, into the Advent season and into the Christmas season, when, when we celebrate God's commitment to this world and God's infinite, intimate involvement in this world, God's presence all around us, um, we can bring this to the story of Bartimaeus and say, Jesus refused to see this person as simply a blind beggar. He insisted on seeing him as a child of God, worth stopping everything. In the same way he put his plans to take a retreat on hold so that he could feed 5,000 at the beginning of the summer. Now, it can sound, I know, as so much of the good news does, like I'm just giving you another Jesus guilty conscience. You know, what is Jesus saying? Think of all the times I have ignored somebody who asked me for help because I had a lot on my plate. Think of all the times I've driven past one of those guys asking for money um, at the intersections in West Lebanon. And, uh, and of course, you might feel sorry for myself. But really, it is an inv invitation to see deeper, to see God, to see the face of Jesus all around us and to actually experience life on a new level. And we can begin with ourselves, and this is important, because among the people who's, who refuses to see the blind beggar as simply a blind beggar is Bartimaeus, the blind beggar. That's why we hear that he called out for Jesus. And um, when the disciples tried to shush him, he called out all the more, because he had faith that God cared about him. He had faith that he was important if you look at the world through God's eyes rather than taking the world at its own evaluation. And you know what Jesus said at the end of the parable? He said to Bartimaeus, as he said to a number of people in the gospel, your faith has made you well. 